Hi, I'm Peggy Farron, and you're watching the Understand Photography Show, where we talk about travel, nature, and fine art photography. Welcome to the show. Today we're going to be talking with author and nature photographer Roger Hammer, who's been on the show before, about getting a book published. He's had many published. The Understand Photography Show is first a podcast, so please listen to us on iTunes or however you listen to podcasts. Um, and please, if you would, give us a, a review on iTunes. It's so helpful to us, to us, and we really, really appreciate it. Thanks to the people recently who have given us reviews. Um, and then we also put it on YouTube and on Facebook. It comes out at 4 p.m. Eastern Time every Friday. And we have on YouTube, we also have a Tuesday photo tip. So that comes out every Tuesday. That's a short little maybe five-minute, three to five-minute video training you on something. Could be Lightroom, could be how to... Sh find your aperture, it just all kinds of different things every Tuesday. Um, the Four Weeks to Proficiency in Photography is our signature course. You know, our motto at Understand Photography is we simplify the technical. So if you're not shooting in the manual mode comfortably, you need to take this class. It's a four week class. You're gonna to learn to shoot in manual in the first class and we're gonna make it so easy. You're gonna be so surprised that you haven't been doing it all along. But then you're gonna have homework so that you really understand what you're doing. And then the next class is composition, but you're gonna build on your techniques as you do your composition homework. You're gonna be shooting in the manual mode. So it's all gonna be coming together for you. By the end of the four weeks, you're gonna be so comfortable shooting in manual. You're gonna understand your flash and how to balance it with backgrounds, all kinds of stuff. So that, um, the next class starts September 11th. We just started the August class on, I think, August 1st. So September 11th, please join us. Um, just go on understandphotography.com and you can find it there. We also have several trips coming up in 2020, so check that out on our website at understandphotography.com. We've got, uh, Joe, of course, is doing his famous Everglades, four-day Everglades trips. You don't want to miss those. Last year, he did three of them be because it was in just, so we only, we limit them to just five people. So you get a lot of attention. Of course, Joe knows the Everglades really well, a lot of fun. Um, Apalachicola, South Africa, just check it out on our, our website and we'll see you there. Now, Roger Hammer is an award-winning author. He's a naturalist and a photographer. He's had many books published, and he's also, this is kind of cool, he's a survivalist instructor for that TV show called Naked and Afraid. Welcome, welcome back. Thank you. So you get to hang out with naked people all day, huh? Yeah, it is. <laughs> they pay me for it. <laughs> I think that's so funny, that's so cool. I, I tried to watch that show one time, but it was so weird. <laughs> so what do you do on the show? I know we're going to talk about the books, I promise, but the show is so interesting. I want to hear what I'm you do. I'm behind scenes. I um, help them with their survival skills and especially um, point out plants that are poisonous. Um, so uh, plants like in Florida, water hemlock, you know, if you ate even a small portion of that plant, it would kill you. So. It's my job to make sure they don't eat the wrong plant. <laughs> do they have any skills at all, survivalists? Some do. Some are already survivalist instructors elsewhere. Oh, and, okay. And they just want that, I guess, just to have this on their resume. But a lot of them just want to prove themselves that they can do it, you know, and say, look, Mom, there I am on national TV naked with, <laughs> with a naked guy. <laughs> I don't think my mother would like that. <laughs> <laughs> I doubt it. <laughs> All right, so we'll talk because you you are a, I mean you were on the show about flower photography in in the yes. past wildflower flower yeah. photography, so you are very interested in nature in general and you you've taught right was that your career was teaching yeah, well I was a, a, a nature center park manager for Miami Dade Parks for 30 oh that's years. right I forgot I and, did know uh, that. so we taught classes we led field trips. I was also a part-time instructor and field trip leader for Fairchild Tropical Botanic Garden in Coral Gables. So, okay, all right. And now that you're now that you're retired, you're busier than ever. Yeah, I don't know how I ever had time to go to work. <laughs> <laughs> so, which came first, your academic interest in the natural world, or was it your well, photography interest? No, I never really had an academic interest. Um, I graduated from Cocoa High School in 1962. And then in 1965, I enlisted in the Army. 
got out in 1968 and moved down to the Homestead area, and it was in 1972 when a book came out on um, native orchids of Florida, and there was 102 orchids at, at the time known in Florida, and I just got enthralled about going out and finding them, and now I'm up to, I think, 96 or 97 species of them that I found in photographs. So, so that, that led to all this other wildflower stuff, and, um, um, and ironically, in um, April of 2012, I received a honorary Doctor of Science degree from Florida International University, and, and they, they told me to go up and say something inspirational to the graduating class, so I told them I used to dream about going to college when I fell asleep in high school. <laughs> So you never went to college? No. And you have a doctorate? Yes. Ah! <laughs> I love it. That's awesome. <laughs> so how many guidebooks have you, uh, are they all guidebooks that you've published? No, all right, let's just talk um, about the guidebooks first then. Well, my first book was Everglades Wildflowers. That was followed by Florida Keys Wildflowers, then Central Florida Wildflowers, and then finally just last year, the complete guide to Florida wildflowers that covers the whole state. Now, these are guidebooks, or they're, they're just they're, they're they're field guides. Field guides, okay. And how how did you? Let's just start with the first book. How, what happened? Expl tell me I the story. I was sitting at home, and the phone rang, and Falcon Guide was on the other end, and asked me if I wanted to write a book on Everglades wildflowers. So how did they know who you were? Um, by talking to other people and knowing, you know asking who or you know who knows Everglades wildflowers really well and my name kept coming up so uh, it was just kind of word of mouth and Falcon Guides is a pretty big publishing company yeah, at, at the time Falcon was a was their separate publishing company they're based in Helena Montana and they produce probably I think the best field guides that are out there and um, during the time when I was writing the first edition of Everglades Wildflowers, they got bought out by Globe Pequot Press. And I don't know what's going on, but when I finally got around to writing the second edition of Everglades Wildflowers, Globe Pequot Press got bought out by Roman and Littlefield. And they're based in, um, in Danielson, Connecticut. So, um, so Falcon is now an imprint of Globe Pequot Press and okay. Roman and Littlefield. So who knows who will so own them next keeps year? Getting bigger and bigger <laughs> and bigger. But but they 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 keep the Falcon Guide um, series out because they're such well known. Oh, books. the branding, yeah. So how um, so did they pay you to do it? They give you a um, an advance if you want an advance. Um, that's usually around fifteen hundred dollars or something like that. So I was able to go out and buy new camera equipment and that sort of stuff right off the bat. But you have to repay that advance through royalties, um, and then you, and then you sign a contract with uh, however much royalties they offer, which is generally between ten percent and fifteen percent of wholesale price costs. Okay. So that's. But the, the, the money can be made, too, by buying your own book for 50 to 60% off and then selling them at conferences and speaking engagements. Yeah, and that's kind of what we, well, we, what we did with our guidebook. Was, uh, we did a, just a photography guide for this area, for Collier County, Naples, Collier County, and Western Everglades. And uh, we self-published it, and then it's just print on demand. So we've got a few printed yeah. that we bring when we do the speaking and yeah, I mean people will ask, ask me about you know why I don't just self-publish, but if you self-publish, you become the the printer, the the warehouse, the secretary, the marketer. You you you're doing all of it, whereas if you work for a publisher, they're doing all of that. You just sit back and wait on a royalty check yeah. at the end of the year. Yeah, that so. sounds much much easier. <laughs> We did have a guy, Dave, David Fitzsimmons, on the show who, he did self-publishing, but he did it in a big way. You know, he put 50 grand into it and, mm -hmm. you know, and he makes good money on his books, but he also took that big leap of faith and, you yeah. know, put a, I think he, obviously, I mean, who knows, I don't know the guy that well, but probably took out a loan to do it. So he yeah, was, and, he was and, gambling a and, lot. And that become, that's becomes a full-time job almost. Oh, know, it was, I think it was beyond a full-time right, job. Right, because you're, you know, you're having to ship stuff, you know, you're doing it all. 
Yeah. But it depends. I mean, you but do if, make more money in the end because it's all coming back to you, whereas with a um, publisher, then you're getting royalties. and It's not as much. And, yeah, and field guides, you know, I mean, they, they sell, depending on which one, they sell okay. Florida Keys Wildflowers is already out of print, and they're not going to reprint it because, um, mainly because th there's not too many people that go down to the Florida Keys. You know, they're going down to drink or fish. Yeah, <laughs> Or yeah. both. And um, so the book just doesn't sell that, that well. But one thing I will say about Falcon is they like to do regional guides, you know, like Everglades in Central Florida and now all of Florida. But the larger the, um, the area the field guide covers, the least useful it becomes because um, you're going to lose some of the, like, like in a Florida wildflower guide, if you take it to Everglades National Park, you'll find, you know, 60 or 70 percent maybe um, of the flowers. But if you take Everglades wildflowers book down there, you're going to find every single plant you see. That's, yeah, that's not exactly right. I, that's why we did the book like we did. We just did just this area. Yeah, yeah. that's Because we had, I mean, the biggest reason was we, had, we just had so many pictures already, you know, <laughs> of right. this area. <laughs> So the next book we want to do is, you know, maybe Lee County, Fort Myers area, but I just, it's a lot of work. It is. So, all right, so that's kind of cool to get paid and, you know, you just use it as supplemental income, right? Right. So that's nice because it's what they say you should have, passive income. You work hard <laughs> for a while to write the book and put it together and then just, that's it. You exactly. don't have to keep selling it, keep selling it. and. Right. So that sounds really nice. How do you, okay, so w now we know how you got their attention. Do you have any s I, advice for somebody who wants a bigger publisher to publish their book, their photography book? I well, mean, it could be a guidebook, it could be a coffee table book or whatever, but. Yeah, it could even be a cookbook or something, but there's a couple of publishers in Florida that are n noteworthy as far as publishing books on Florida, and one of them is the University Press of Florida, mm -hmm. which I published one book through them called Attracting Hummingbirds and Butterflies in Tropical Florida. And um, the other one is Pineapple Press. And if it has anything to do with Florida, those are the two publishers I would approach. approach. And basically you just contact them and send them a sample of what it is that you're trying to do. now. Once you've gotten a book published, it becomes easier to, um, you know, gain interest in, from other publishers. So um, when I did that book for University Press of Florida, um, I was already known, you know, uh, yeah. as far as a wallflower book photographer, and and uh, uh, they knew that I um, taught classes on attracting hummingbirds and butterflies and. That sort of thing so it was an easy sell okay that's awesome who do you contact within the company like what kind of what's the title of the person who makes those decisions usually um the acquisitions editor oh i would never have thought of that i don't even know what ac acquisitions <laughs> editor i never heard of a title like that even okay well that's good to know because if somebody wants to do that then that's who they look for yeah okay um what was it like working with them? Was it like, do they have strict deadlines? Yes, they are. Um, Falcon's a little bit more strict than um, than University Press of Florida. Um, they're going to give you a deadline. Again, if you're a new f person on board, after about um, th three months or so, they give you a year and a half for the for their wallflower guides. Okay. From the time you sign a contract to the time you have to turn in the manuscript and all the photographs is about a year and a half. Which sounds like a long time, but I oh, bet but it's you not. you start working on like <laughs> called a dog in the beginning because it can catch up with you. And especially with wildflowers because, you know, they have flowering seasons. It's not like you can just go out any day and photograph something. You have to know when, you have to know where they are. You have to know when they're flowering and that sort of thing. So. Um, so, so when, when you're um, first starting to work for them, they're going to want to see a sample of the text and, and samples of the wildflower f photos after about four months Okay. to make sure you're on track. Yeah. But once I went through that, you know, through those hurdles in the beginning with Everglades wildflowers, after that they've never 
said a word about having to send stuff in. Now, did they give you the like the format, or did you have your own format for that? No, no, they have they have their set format, and and it's kind of funny too, as each publisher might have their own um, uh, writing style. Oh, I didn't you know, think so, about so that. So there's a whole style issue too that you have to know, and I've gotten used to Falcon, so I know what it is they like, and and that's stuff like you know our common names capitalized or not, you know. And some publishers want them capitalized and others don't. And okay. Falcon doesn't, so it makes it easy, unless it's a proper name. So they probably tell you all that they, in the beginning. They, yeah, you know all that from the beginning. And there's a editor that they assign to you, and then if you have particular questions, you just email them and say, you know, what do I do? Because what I like to do is find out, you know, you know, do you want this this word capitalized or not? And you know, like like if it's a uh, like like Miami Dade County, I would always capitalize the word county. But if it was um, uh, Miami Dade and Broward counties, uh. I, I, I would usually not capitalize counties, but they wanted to capitalize. So anyway, it, it avoided a whole bunch of editing later on. Okay, okay. And so, I mean, when you first okay, let's just say you just signed the contract. Were you in contact with that editor pretty regularly right in the beginning to make sure you were on the right track? Because you didn't go four months without talking to somebody right in the beginning, did you? Yes. <laughs> did you really? Yeah. I just, oh. Uh, they, they sent me samples of other wildflower gu guides of theirs so that mm -hmm. I would see the format and see, you know, what they look like and everything. Okay. So I basically you felt just confident. To, yeah, I mean, they give you a, a, a word count for the, for the text if it's two per page. I think it was 800 words you could have for each species. If it was a one per page photo, it was 1,200 words. So you had to stay within that okay. guideline so it didn't get too, you know, so you didn't have to. Was that hard to do? It's harder than you think. It sounds and, hard to and, me. And, and sometimes, you know, uh, I mean, if it was some common wildflower that had a neat story to tell about it, you know, you have to like edit it down. But other plants, you're thinking, oh my God, what do I say? You know, uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know what, what, what do you say about this to make up, you know, 800 words? But uh, one of the things I did in all of my books was I explained what the Latin name means in English for each species. So, so that alone, or if it was named after a person, you know, I'll, I'll talk about who that person story, was, yeah. you know, the history of that person, or. Um, or, or maybe even the person that named it first, you know, and talk about that person. And so you can fill in the blanks, you know, easy enough if you, if you run into problems. You need to. <laughs> something to say about it. Now, did you, so you had a year and a half. Did you, like, give yourself a deadline of a year or something like that? Or did you? Well, I mean, yeah, you can see what's going, you know, again, it's, it's the flowering seasons that, that you really need to keep up with. You know, you need to make your list of the, of the of your target plants but here's what happens with um like with the complete guide to florida wildflowers um it was going to have about 700 species in it whereas the everglades wildflowers has around 360 same with central florida wildflowers so the regional guides were smaller books but this the florida guide, guide was was much larger so the my ace in the hole was with the Everglades, or with a complete guide to Florida wildflowers, was I'd already done Florida Keys, I'd already done Everglades, I'd already done Central Florida. So it was that North Florida and the Panhandle area that I had to concentrate on. The bummer was that I live in Homestead, and I would get calls from friends of mine that lived in the Panhandle and say, hey, Roger, we found this and this and this and this and this, and you need to get up here. So 10 hours later, I would show oh. up. Oh. run around for three or four days photographing and drive back and then two weeks later three weeks later the phone rings hey roger we found this and this and this and this and here go another so i did i think 10 10 or 12 trips to the panhandle um just to just to make sure i covered the panhandle right. and north florida well enough because i didn't want the book to be more partial to what I'd already done. Right. Oh my gosh. And so that's, you should have just moved up there. Uh, well, I know, but um, you know, I have a a wife and dogs and they don't want to move, huh? <laughs> Especially the cats. Um, they don't like to go anywhere. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, her, my my wife's dad helped out by showing up and de dealing with them, you know. Wow. Uh, but anyway, um, so you know, just just knowing the flowering seasons, knowing people that can point out where things are that you're 
would spend days to, to find and, yeah. and have them take you directly to them. That was a godsend. And that's just from over the years, just from all the just, you know, networking you've done over the years. Right, just knowing, knowing the right people. And, that, know, is, that is I get amazing. I with a little help from my friends. Yeah. Well, how many images did you put? In, oh, you just told me, 390-something. Three, well, 360-ish in, um, in the regional guides. And then um, I think the complete guide to Florida wildflowers has 686. Did they give you those numbers? No, you have to, you have to, this is another squirrely thing. They give you the number of pages that you're allowed. And I had to do a lot of math to, using my other books to figure out how many wildflowers would fit in 400 pages for the complete guide. Oh, wow. And then I started toning down the, the, the introduction because most people don't read that anyway. Mm -hmm. And then all the habitats, you know, so I toned the habitats down, you know, I lumped a lot of them into one, you know, and, and uh, but also Falcon Guides, uh, another um, issue with organizing these books is Falcon um, Guides are uh, arranged by color. Okay. So there's six color groups that you use, you know, blue and purple, pink, white, red and orange, brown and green, and so you have to um, not only ar arrange the flowers by, by the proper color, they're alphabetical by first plant family and then genus and species, and if there's two per pagers coming up to a one per page, you have to have an even number of two per page, obviously, before you the one per page, so it, it gets a little bit, you know. Wow, <laughs> wow. So Man, can, so now can, I'm glad I self-published. <laughs> so, so you can either add a species to make it an even number, or subtract one, or 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 make the one per page or a two per page. You know, and it, there's ways there's to get of, around. Yeah, but it's hard. You or, gotta or say, well, that that one looks a little bit more pink than blue. So what the heck, and stick it over the pink. So you do the whole design by yourself because yes. they give you. Do you do it? What do you use? Well, I mean, and not, design. Not, not, no, no, not really the design. I I arrange it. The manuscript is um, it's arranged by, you know, um, the, the two per pagers, and then there's one per page, and I all let the editor know in red ink, you know, I'll just type in their editor. This is a one per page. Oh, I see. You know, and, and then, then they put it together. Right, you probably but, use an end design. You have to get it together, where there's an even number of two per pagers before the one per page. Oh my gosh. I know. Ah. <laughs> stuff you don't really anticipate until it happens and you go, oh my God. Oh, so now did you get the plants at different stages of, or did you just wait until they were flowering? I just wait till it, I mean, one of the, um, one of the negative comments I've, I've had on, on, on these guides and on all falcon guides is, you know, oh, there should also be a photo of the leaves and all. Well, it's a wildflower guide. So, you know, you're not, it's not really meant to be able to, to identify plants that aren't in flower. I mean, the very word wildflower guide is, yeah, you know, that wildflowers sense. of Everglades. I mean, it's, it's, it's talking about the flowers. Um, I try to get some of the leaves in the, in the photo a little bit, but in the text, the very first part of the text is the description of the plant. So it tells you if the leaves are opposite, alternate, if they're lance-shaped or ovate. Okay. You know, and, and then there's a flowering season, and then the range of the, of, and then the comments. And the comments is where you can just kind of talk about the plant. So is it best to shoot like a flower straight on mostly, or does it depend on the flower? It depends on the flower. Um, usually they're straight on because that's the way most the people most. are gonna, gonna look at, at it. You know, they're gonna look at it, look at it you know, straight on. Um, I mean, composition adds a lot to these books, you know, but you don't want to get too artistic, you know, or if there's a diagnostic feature that's, that, that y you can, you know, c kind of concentrate on, that's good to do. You mean like something specific about that flower? About that flower to tell it apart from other members of the genus, you know, there's some things, you know, the shape of the calyx or something like that, you know, that... I don't even you know what a calyx is. That's that little part behind the flower that the flower petals are sitting on that little oh so when I just learned a new word <laughs> <laughs> but, but you know I mean I, I just try to take photos where you can actually identify the flower by looking at the photo and let it go with that yeah okay all right 
What's your go-to gear? What are you using for photography gear? Is it the same as what you were using when you were on Pretty here? Pretty much. Episode 24? I have 24? a DA10, but I also have, I mean, my go-to equipment, and, and I, I travel by foot, and I'm almost always by myself, so I have a lightweight tripod with my Nikon D810. I have a separate lightweight tripod with a clamp on it. It's, the, um, it's got a, a clamp that clamps onto the leg of the tripod, a movable arm and a little clip at the end okay. to where you can clip that onto the stem of a flower to hold it still. Which is pretty important. Yeah. <laughs> and the other thing I always carry is a white light diffusing umbrella. Ah. And that does three things. It can help block the wind. It diffuses the, the sunlight, um, especially if it's full sun in a white flower. You know, it'll diffuse it down to where it's not so stark. And it eliminates shadows. Now, how do you use that umbrella? I mean, how do you attach it? Do you attach it to something? No, I, or? I set it on the ground with the leg of the umbrella sitting on the ground and just you know, move it around to where it's, it's blocking everything, but not in view of the, you know, of the camera. So, so are you shooting? I mean, sometimes you have to hold it yourself. Are you shooting through it, or I'm no, confused? No. So you're shooting. It's it's just, it's, it's just it's, like a shade, or like a just not shade. a shade, but a, right, right. a scrim, I guess, right. more of a scrim. Well, I'll tell you one real quick um, funny story. I was in Okeechobee County, and I was photographing a spider lily that has white flowers. And it was on the side of the road, so I pulled off the road and I got out and I had my umbrella open and everything. And the, I heard a car engine, it was the Okeechobee County Sheriff. And uh, I got up and walked over and I said, is there any problem, officer? And he says, no, sir. He says, well, we just don't see too many long-haired boys with parasols. Out there. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess I did look up. I guess I did look rather odd. I was probably the talk of the donut shop later on in the day. <laughs> That's but, a great story. But that's a that that that's a godsend <laughs> for um, again for blocking the wind and diffusing oh, the wind and, too. Diffu and diffusing the light. I'm still not clear on how you're putting it there though. Well, if it's a low flower, you know you can just stick it into the ground. Yeah, you just you just set it there. It's kind of at an angle, you know, and then you just move it around and um, to make sure the whole thing is in the shade. How big what, is the umbrella? Pretty small. I probably. got two sizes. There's one that's about 18 inches, and one that's probably 24 inches. Okay, kind of so um, kind of small, but yeah, yeah. just white. Yeah, yeah, just white. You know, it's just, just to diffuse. You buy them in for, in photography stores. Um, for, they're more you know, for. It's not for rain. It's for. It's. it's they're actually, for studio lights. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So those. That's really about about the main equipment. Oh, do you use flash? Very, very rarely. Okay. Um, only in some cases when it's really overcast and just so dark, because I shoot almost always at f thirty two, between f thirty two, well, sometimes even f forty six, up to maybe your um, to maybe f. 22 or 18 if I'm because you, know, you want everything sharp everything sharp info you know with the, what kind of lens goes to f40 would you say f what f well I've if, if it's if it's in full sun it'll it'll go to f46 it's a Nikon Nikkor um, 105 millimeter 2.8 lens wow and has that an aperture that goes to f40 something yeah f46 wow, wow. <laughs> That's incredible. And that's, and that's a macro. Lens. That's a macro lens. Yeah. Wow. Nikon calls them micros, but yeah, a macro. Um, it's about a nine hundred dollar lens, but. Um, but that's uh, your main. With, that's your uh, go-to that, lens. That's the lens I've got. Th three cameras, and I've got that same lens on all three cameras. So. Hey, when you get a favorite lens, I've got a favorite lens, and I, for me, I only have one though. But I bought that lens when I first started my business in 2001. And it's my still my main lens that I use. Right. Mine is, of course, I have do something different than you, but I, I love that lens. Well, I, it's, um, it was really expensive, but I certainly haven't gotten my money out of it in sure. 19 years. Yep. So it's had to be you know, recalibrated a few times, yeah. but which well, is that's expensive. My, that's my wildflower <laughs> lens. Um, there's other books I've written. Um, there's one on exploring Everglades National Park, and so in that book I had to photograph, you know, birds and snakes and you know, uh, actually and, I think and, Joe, and scenery and that kind of stuff. I'm pretty sure Joe bought that book because when he 
because I think you were, he was already doing the Everglades tours mm -hmm. when you were here, but I think yeah. he liked your book. And now, now I'm working on a book, another Falcon Guide called Paddling Everglades in Biscayne National Park. So, but there again, you know, I need photos of trails, birds, things that people will see. And so I, I bought a, um, a Sony RX10 III camera that has a fixed lens uh -huh. on it. Uh -huh. And the thing's a 35 millimeter to 600. I, I know that camera. And, and it's like, are you, are you kidding? So I mean, I, it has a small sensor, so you're not going to make huge pictures right, out of it, but right. you don't need huge pictures for the book. Exactly. Most books are kind of small. Right. <laughs> yeah, so that's the lens I bought just to take pictures of birds. And, it's still heavy, though. Yeah. It's not that heavy. I mean, I not, mean it's not that it's heavy compared like, to what you're carrying with right, the 810, but... nothing like the 9 I was surprised when I... I thought it was going to be lighter than, you know, I was like, oh, this thing's heavy. But I don't have one. I've just had several people have private lessons with me right. who do have them. So yeah. I've but touched and felt it. And yeah, it's kind of an easy and way And I'm, I'm tempted for... because I like that long range. It's just that yeah, my but... luck, I would take the shot of a lifetime. And of course, when I sell my artwork, I like to sell big. Right. And it would start falling apart, you it know. It would, it would. But yeah, for what I do, it's perfect so I can carry that camera with me and have it handy and but wildflower photography is is that Nikon D810 and the 105 millimeter and, macro and you don't do much post post processing do you clean like the bugs off or anything like sometimes, that sometimes or holes in leaves or especially spider webs I don't care how long you stare at a flower and finally take a picture and get it back and and download it and there's a spider web you know, <laughs> like, where'd that come from <laughs> Um, so, oh, yeah, geez. that sort of stuff. Um, but yeah, no, other than that, I don't do post-processing. Okay, so when you were writing the text, did you uh, did you have to do a lot of research for each flower? Well, I guess you had to do. Yeah, I mean, just some. to find out what the botanical name means if you don't already know. I mean, you know, the word lanceolata is obviously referring to a lance-shaped or spear-shaped leaf. Obviously. But, but, well, yeah. But, <laughs> But um, <laughs> but you know some of those some of the words are like you know what is, what on earth does that mean and so it was a lot of work. Yeah. Do you have any any idea how many hours you put into like how many hours you put into the big book? A lot. A lot. <laughs> yeah, just ten hours each way to the panhandle each time. Oh my gosh. Yeah, I mean just not only time traveling and all that, but um, but yeah, just the research and you know looking stuff up. Um, I mean, there are books that, that explain what the Latin names mean, so, uh, you know, I've got a book on botanical Latin that you can look up and see what that word means and then explain it in easier terms. Wow. <laughs> um, so what's different about your guidebook than any other guidebook? Well, other guidebooks that are out there, there's one Florida wildflower guidebook that's arranged by plant family. And if you're a botanist and you know plant families, then that's nice because then all the relatives are going to be together in the book okay. rather than scattered around. You know, if it's like in my book, if one's got a pink flower and one's got a yellow flower, they're going to be in Oh, two yeah, because you're by color. Even though they're in the same gene, you know, they're closely uh -huh. related. So that book doesn't work good unless you're a botanist and you know plant families. Other books, there's one book out that's arranged by plant communities. And that fails because, A, most people don't know what plant community they're standing in yeah. to even look up that plant community in the book. And B, there's plants like, um, a good example would be the butterfly orchid. That orchid is in pine flatwoods, it's in mangroves and buttonwoods, it's in deciduous forests, it's in hardwood hammocks, it's in every plant community except prairies. Okay. So where would you put it? You know, yeah. In the book, you know? Yeah. It, it doesn't. It doesn't fall like like if you go into this ha this habitat, you're going to see it, but not in that one. That doesn't work very well. So color is the color best is way. a good idea for, for, for the novice. For me, I would do that for, now, the, for novices. If you see a yellow flower, you start thumbing through the yellow section. Yeah. Rather than the whole book. And it's not like birds where they change colors. Right. <laughs> Gosh, I was when I was you know. I was trained as a portrait and wedding photographer, 
And then when I started teaching, everybody who came to my class was a nature photographer. So I had to <laughs> get into nature photography just, and I didn't know any, I've lived in Florida most of my life, but I knew that was an egret or a heron. I'm not sure which one, you know? Right. And so now it's like, oh, that's a snowy and that's a, you know, and that's a right. tricolor. And I'm like, okay, I have to learn what all this stuff is. And so I saw a tricolor heron one time and it had a bright, like a fluorescent blue beak. I put it on Facebook. I didn't get a, of course I didn't have a camera with me. I didn't even have my cell phone because I was going out for my morning walk and I'm not, my girlfriend that I walk with, I'm not allowed to bring my phone because she wants me to walk and stay focused. But um, I kept saying bright blue beak. Nobody, nobody knew what I was talking about. But I guess during breeding season, they have a bright, because the rest of the time it's brown. And then what are the little blue herons? They're white mm -hmm. and then they're blue and oh. Yeah, Flowers are yeah, always the same all color. Blue herons are, are white. Yeah, and then they get dark. It's crazy. But do and then ibis are dark when they're juveniles and white when they're adults. You're right. <laughs> now, do flowers? Any flowers do anything like that? Well, there's albino forms of some. But I mean, do they flowers. change colors? Um, there's a few that that change color with age. They might open white and then fade to pink um, before they turn brown. Oh, like us, we start with dark hair and go gray. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I dyed mine gray to give me that distinguished look. Oh, that was it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, has, this is a, a question you might not even know the answer to, but it just popped in my head. Have the apps on our phones hurt your book sales? Because I know for I me, if I hear a song on the radio, I just pull out that app on my phone. What song Shazam. is this? Yeah. And I know they have bird apps and fl I'm sure they probably have flower apps. Yeah, but they, you know, they might get you in the ballpark, but they might not say this Coreopsis here is different from that Coreopsis there or this Coreopsis here. And they all have yellow, <clears throat> you know, ray, ray florets, which most people call petals. Um, so is they're they're not going to separate. It, they're not going to put as much detail. in No, it. it might get you to Coreopsis, but then the bed is off after that. What about okay? So you've got waterproof pamphlet guides too. What yes. are those? They each I brought some. Um, they each have uh, 90 photos in them, so they're more for like. You know the German tourist that's in the Everglades for the day, uh -huh. and they don't want to buy a twenty-five dollar book or a thirty dollar book. They want to buy an eight dollar card that, okay. that has just the really common stuff that they're likely going to see. And um, so it's like a laminated thing that folds up. Yes. Okay. Yes, and they're um, published by um, Quick Reference Publishing. Okay. They're up in um, Boca Raton. So that was was that your idea? You thought, oh, I got to come up with a better idea for the tourists. No, she did that. This um, the lady that owns uh, Quick Reference Publishing, and she found she started she started in Austin, Texas, and um, started the, her business, and then ended up moving to um, Boca Raton, which is where she lives now. Everybody and, moves to Florida, right? <laughs> but they have those guides are out. Um, I've done um, I think three ones on wildflowers and one on trees of South Florida. But there's others on birds, butterflies. There's a new one even on marijuana. Ah! You know, it's, it's got all the different <laughs> photos of all the buds of different <laughs> kinds of marijuana. This is Acapulco Gold, and this, you know. Oh my but, gosh! Um, but um, so, so there's there's some on fish. There's some there's one on sharks. There's there everything. You know. Was that a lot easier to put together? I would imagine. Oh, yeah, very easy because there's hardly any text. You know, it's just a very very little text in the photo and. Yeah, you can put one of those together in a matter of weeks. And, wh and where does she sell those? In gift shops? Everywhere, yeah. State park. Um, oh, that would make sense, gift yeah. Gift shops, you know, bookstores, um, where, wherever she can get them. Yeah, of course. Okay, so you have another book, 50 Classic Views of the Sunshine State. What, what is that? Um, it's, uh, it's kind of a miniature um, coffee table book. Okay. And again, How? again, I was contacted by them and asked if I would uh, write this book on 50, uh, 50 icons of Florida. And 
So, and, and that can be anything, you know? I mean, I put uh, Miami Beach Art Deco in it, uh, Marjorie Kinnan Rawlings, you know, the author of The Yearling and the Cross Creek. And so I drove to Cross Creek and went to the Marjorie Kinnan Rawlings State Park and took a picture of her cottage. And then I found out where she was buried and went and took a picture of her tombstone. Oh, and, I love that. And that kind of stuff, you know? And um, American Bison I put in there. People don't realize there's wild American bison in Florida. Is that in, in Gainesville? Is that where you Gaines Prairie. Yeah. My my nephew went to college there and I said, Oh, when when he went there I said, Oh, I've been my dream to go and see the wild horses and bison and he yeah, he yeah, saw yeah, them many bison, times. The cattle, the cracker cattle are still there. Um, Apalachicola oysters was in there, pink plastic lawn flamingos. Ah, uh, <laughs> what um, about Bach Tower? Um, I started to that? put Bach Tower in there, and I don't know, it just didn't make the cut. But I was, I've never been there. Can you believe it? Oh yeah, it's kind of a neat, neat I've been, neat I've been in Florida since um, 1970. I did a lot of wildflower photography there. there there's some natural there. areas in there. And, really? And there's also a endangered species. Um, they have a, um, a program there where they grow state-listed endangered species to to um, get seeds and then take them back out and put them in the wild. They do that at Bach Tower? So, yeah, so it was one-stop shopping rather than, you know, looking for all these endangered species. You they were go, all right there. You go there and you go, and they've got labels on them and everything. It's like, oh man, this is cheating. <laughs> but, um, but, but didn't but make there, the icons. There, there, right, but there was a lot of, um, I mean, you know, key lime pies in there you know, margaritas and that kind of stuff. Oh, of course, yeah. <laughs> so, Sloppy West, Joe's? Does yeah, Sloppy yeah, Joe's yeah, make sloppy it? Sloppy Joe's. <laughs> well, Key West is in there. Of course. And, um, and you know, Flagler's Railroad. And that, that, uh, that book sounds like it was more fun. It was, and we got to travel. Um, Did all, your wife all, go? Yeah, I got and to you travel just... all over the state. And there were some things like, um, like Spook Hill, you know, when we went there and looked at it, it was like, well, it's a, it's a street, you know. So. I remember going to Spook yeah, Hill when and, I was 20 years old. <laughs> Devil, Devil's Mill Hopper. I know. went down there when I was 45, and, and, there and again, I could barely like, make it up those stairs. <laughs> and now I don't know. Although I, I may be but in better there shape again, you now. Know, I tried taking pictures, and it was just no. You know, there's no the pictures. pictures. There, just there's just no. It's, it's like just a, a sinkhole. Right. Yeah, so with I stairs. Thought, well, can that idea? But you know the St. Augustine. Um, forts and that kind you know so it was it was interesting to go to all these different places is there anything in jacksonville I, i've never really been to jacksonville no i've never made no. it to jacksonville st augustine was as close as i got to jacksonville and was that published that's is that a guide still or where, who published that um it's um it's one of the glow pequot okay imprints. so this, so you're one of their go-to yeah. authors basically yeah, yeah. if they have the something go, florida they contact roger hammer right <laughs> was it completely different was it well it sounds like it was a lot more fun yeah it was 300 words of text and a photo right next to each other so it's kind of like you know like i'll say it's like a, a miniature coffee table book in uh, a way. and how miniature i mean i can see it but what is that eight by eight yeah i think so okay that sounds really cool. It's, it looks like a good book. I'm going to look at it. I don't think you had that book last time you were here. No, I didn't, I don't okay. think. And, um, um, you know, Biscayne Bay, of course, is is in the book, and, or Biscayne National Park. And I, you know, I've never been there either. I'm, 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 I, well, you know the photography business a little bit. Ten years ago, I was like, or 11 years ago, I was like, ah. Oh, finally made it, I'm making good money, I worked so hard to get this, you know, it took me 10 years to get there, or nine years or something like that, working hard, to, and I finally got to the point where I felt like I could start slowing down, and then I went broke. The business just <laughs> changed like that. And so, again, I was working a million hours a week, so I'm finally getting to the point again, it's a little scary, because I'm getting to the point again where I could start taking some time off and getting out and exploring, and my problem is I learned how to house swap, and so now I always go to Europe because I go for free, and I can stay for a long time when it's free, and there's nothing going on here in the summer. A lot of mosquitoes. <laughs> <Sure. laughs> Alright, so um, what's, what are five tips for someone who wants to get their books published by a real publishing company, not self-publish? Well, I mean, um, depends on what kind of book, obviously, but um, the key is to um, 
you know, have an idea and to put, you know, to present it to them, you know, contact the, the uh, an editor and say, here's an idea that I have, you know, and here's some sample. Or, you know, there's a friend of mine that just contacted uh, University Press of Florida and, and um, he sent them samples of his work and they made some constructive criticism and he's gone back and now he's sent it back again. So that's the process okay. uh, to, you know, to get your way in the, in the door. Like I say, once you have a book published, then it becomes a, a little easier because you're already, you know, you've been there, done that kind of a thing. But again, uh, if, uh, if it was in Florida, I would look first at um, uh, the two publishers that are pretty much Florida only, uh, Pineapple and University Press of Florida. Now, what if somebody's listening to this and they live in, I don't know, California? How, do, how would they find out who the I guess right just, publishers I would, are? I would just um, get on the internet and start, you know, Search. just start looking. Go on Facebook and ask. Yeah, <laughs> That's yeah, why I always right. do yeah, that. exactly. Go on Facebook, hey. Yeah. Or, you know, if, if you have a specific type of book, you know, go to a library and find that type of book that somebody else oh. has done and see who published it. That's brilliant. And then go from there. But um, it's not it's not easy. Um, I was lucky because they just they called found me. you. Yeah. Yeah. But um, but to, it's like photography. You know, if you're going to make a living at photography, that's a hard. You know, from being on the outside and suddenly you're a no no name person. It's it's a tough way to to weasel your way in. You know, you got to have something that's a little bit different, I guess. So uh, you had a lot of credibility, so that helped a lot. Yeah, yeah. Just having my name out there as knowing as having you know. You were the big flower expert. Yeah, yeah. Father Nature, so to speak. Ah. <laughs> so uh, that's that's helped in both of his publishing and of course Naked and Afraid, you know, knowing the plants. And they came up, they, they approached you as well. Right. Just from word of mouth basically. Yes. So to me it sounds like you need to be good at what you do. Right. And you have to be out there so, or networking. Out there, right. Networking with other people. Right. Selling yourself and getting your name out there. And Now how long ago was your first book? Um, 1999. And you were still working at the time at yes. the Park Service? Yes. Yeah. As you say, Park Mi Service? Miami-Dade Parks Department. Parks Department. Yeah, I was a manager of a 120-acre nature center. Wow. So you yes. were working full-time when you put that first book out? Yes. That had to be tough. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, I, I live within, um, that was Everglades Wildflowers. And I live, I can be in Everglades National Park in 15 minutes. You live my, in Homestead, and you lived in Homestead at right, the time. Okay. Right, and I still do. Because that's where the entrance is, right? The, the, main, the lower en entrance. The main entrance. Yeah. So 15 minutes from my house, I'm in the park, you know, so, and I know where all those plants are, so it was just a matter of waiting for them to flower. The orchids are the ones that have pretty much a very distinct flowering season, whereas other plants might, you know, you might find them flowering all the year. Um, but no, the but, orchids, I'm not a big but, flower person, but I know the guy that I like to go in the Everglades with, Chris Hopkins, he likes to hunt for orchids. Right. So that's our mission when we go yeah. out. But we're going to, especially if you want to find the ghost orchids, you're, you're, you're in water up to your waist or deeper sometimes. Do you right. have to do that a lot? Yes. <laughs> yeah, I so it's not just Russian. It's in not my just. Life that I've forgotten how many I've photographed. Um, I have one that's really cute. It just came up on my Instagram. It's, it came out like a little heart. Mm -hmm. It looks so cute. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh! Now, I interrupted you. Did you have the five tips, or did we kind of? Because I kind of well, interrupted I mean, you. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, being a person where they called me, it was. Uh, I've not ever had to be in that arena of of, of, of really going of, out and marketing, going out and mar you know, finding finding them. But I do know of people, you know, friends of mine that are, you know, trying to get get into that. But main thing is, don't I, be afraid of rejection. Probably, like they say to for, any author. That's for sure. Um, but yeah, whatever your interests are, find out which publisher likes that type of. of yeah, because I forgot book. to ask you also, what was the big difference between a coffee table? type of book 
Oh, but they approached you for that too. Right. Okay, so that wouldn't be a sales. I was thinking of sell, selling wives. It seems like there are more coffee table type of books than guidebooks. Yeah, yeah, the guidebooks here, you know, it's, if there's already a bunch of guidebooks out there, then you don't want to get into that arena because there's just no, there's not going to be any interest for yet another guidebook on right. the same. Um, the same thing, but um, there's a friend of mine that's um, wrote a book on the, the the wildflowers of the southeastern United States. But again, the, the the larger the geographic region that a wildflower guide covers, the less useful it becomes. Yeah. Because if you took his book into Everglades National Park, you might find 30% of what you're looking at. Yeah. You know, just because it's not covering everything that's down there. I, I, take, I agree. You, that you doesn't take Everglades seem like... wildflowers out there and you're probably going to see every... But if you were do, if it was a guide, you know, if you're going to do a regional guide of any sort, it should be like a, like a guide to, you know, the favorite spots in the zoo, you know, or something, not, not specifically like for flowers right, or birds right, or anything right. like yeah. that. I mean, it's too big a of a... On the bars, you know, I mean, <laughs> you know, the... You know, if you did a book on the bars of the keys, you're going to cover all of them. <laughs> I don't know. Could you cover all of them? Ah! Uh, that would be a pretty big book. <laughs> you know where it would be hard? It would be in Ireland. I went to Ireland yeah, a couple yeah. of years oh, ago, yeah, and they yeah. had one little town, and he goes, we were on a bus tour, and the town was probably five blocks long, and he goes, okay, you guys, pay attention. So he started counting the pubs, and there were like 19, <laughs> and it was five blocks long, the whole town. <laughs> I know. <laughs> oh, they like to drink in Ireland. I'll say. I drank more in Ireland. I was on vacation with my aunt, the nun. <laughs> I drank more there than I ever drank. <laughs> Hung up more pubs with a nun than I ever, no, well, maybe not ever, because I, I was quite a little party girl when I was young, but whatever. I've grown out of that. I'm sure you have. So what, <laughs> what do you got coming up? Well, working on this um, paddling Everglades and Biscayne National Parks. Um, that book is going to cover all of the paddling trails and routes. I've paddled the um, Everglades Wilderness Waterway, which is 99 miles. I've paddled that three times solo. Um, wow. Yeah, because Everglades, you're a survivalist. From, yeah, from you Everglades know what to do? City down to Flamingo. It takes about, I mean, you can do it faster, but I usually take about 10 days wow. and do that. And then I, um, I bought a brand new, um, really uh, expensive, lightweight 16 foot canoe. And my, the maiden voyage of it was from Flamingo around Cape Sable and up to Highland Beach and then back through the interior in a big loop. And that was 10 days and 120 miles, something like that. Wow. And you did that all by yourself? Yeah. You don't get lonely out there? No, not really. What, I, what I'm amazed at is what Miami-Dade County has 2.5 million people. And I paddled out there for 10 days and never saw another soul. You know, it's like... Where are all these people? <laughs> They're not wow. out here. Wow, that's amazing. So, um, I mean, and I enjoy that, you know, it's just, I mean, not only the challenge, but just the solitude and just being out there and being able to, you know. Even in Flamingo, out. with the bugs. Yeah, I mean, um, just not too long ago, I was out there photographing uh, one of the orchids that's out in the mangrove buttonwood area, and, and somebody asked me, um, how it was that I managed to get this picture and I told him that I threw a basketball through the mosquitoes and took the picture through the <laughs> hole. <laughs> <laughs> we, went, we went down there a few weeks ago and that was the first time I had ever been to Flamingo. And, uh, you know, the bugs were pretty bad and he, he just wanted to keep hiking and I'm like, I'm not enjoying this. <laughs> so we got back in the van and then we looked because they put up these little Tents? Did you see those? Have yes. you been down there recently? Yeah, eco tents. They're they're kind of new, I guess, because he had never seen them. I haven't even rented one yet. Yeah, and uh, I thought, and there's a beach. Right. I'm like, who would want to stay here? He said, well, the bugs aren't as bad in the winter, but they're still pretty bad, right? Yeah, they're not even going to have them up in the summertime. I mean, even though they're building them now, they're going to take them down. A for hurricanes, but B, they're just they nobody, look nice nobody, though. Yeah, but there's nobody going to be staying in those in the summertime, so. Um, but you know the the book on paddling um, it's going to cover uh, 
you know, you can launch right there, right off that, that beach that you're talking about, you okay. know, and paddle out. And, and if you look right out in front of there, um, you'll see the Oyster Keys, and that's where Guy Bradley, the Audubon Warden, got murdered in 1905. So, that, you know, one of my trips is a historic paddle out to Oyster Key, the same exact trip that Guy Bradley Oh, cool. Did. I mean, not cool that he Except got murdered well, or anything. Your trip will be round trip. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> so when is that going to come out? Or what's um, the your manuscripts due in August? So probably in the spring of 2020 is when the book will probably ah, be released. Uh, so this this is going to be broadcast in August. Oh, but it won't come yeah. out until spring. You don't think? Probably spring yeah. of 2020. Right. And um, oh, so you have a lot to do, buddy. Man, we better hurry up and get all, finished. All, almost, all, <laughs> all, almost all of it's done. I'm organizing um, map, maps, charts now. You know, with drawing the routes on the because they 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 have cartographers that draw the stuff for the book. So um, all the text and stuff is done. So you came up with that idea and pitched it to the publisher. No, <laughs> they came up with that idea too. Well, there was another book that they. P published um, called um, Exploring e uh, Paddling Everglades National Park, but um, that author that there was a lot of errors in it. Um, there was an issue with perhaps some plagiarism going on, so they pulled that book off the market, uh. and then they then I got asked to. to to write that, they actually they asked me to write it in the beginning, but I was in the process of working on another book at the time, and and then after this, um, University Press of Florida has agreed to let me write a book on um, attracting migratory birds in Florida. Ooh! So you know how you go about attracting the migra migratory birds. That is cool. Rather than just resident. Like our painted buntings migratory, right? Yeah, because I had they're all over our feeders where they they just I had, left recently. But. I had one man, male, I guess, and two females, and then he disappeared, and I didn't see him for months. Well, I haven't the, seen the, him. The males leave first. To oh, go is set that up, why? Set up camp and oh. start chirping for the females to show up. I was wondering. I thought, what a and, jerk! He had two women. He left yeah, them both. Uh, now they're gonna, <laughs> So they're only here in Florida. They're only, you know, they, they migrate. They, they show up in our area um, around the very end of September, early October, and then they're gone by May. And so we'll yeah, the ladies them. are gone now, too. Yeah, yeah. Now so, I have so, sparrows. So you, won't, yeah, so you won't see them again. But, but yeah, them, I mean, Purple Martins, um, you know, there's all the warblers just about. Purple Martins, Mar we see those in our walk every morning. They're yeah, still they're, here. They're around here now. Yeah. yeah. So they're so, so pretty. So, yeah, this new book will be about attracting migratory birds. You know, oh, that's so cool! Yeah. I, I love my bird feeder so much. I I never had one until a couple of years ago, and I love it. It's really fun. I got to get that hummingbird book. I told you I was going to get it last time. I didn't get it yet. <laughs> <laughs> what about your your TV show? Anything going on with that? My TV show, Naked and Afraid. Oh. Um, they contacted me recently. They wanted to do a uh, episode on um, in Charlotte County, and the ranch was completely flooded. There was no dry land anywhere, oh. so they canceled that. Then they're looking back up at Lake County, but yeah, they're. I just waiting on the you know just. I never know anything until if, you know, I either get an email or the phone rings and says. Do you hey. get much notice? Yeah, usually oh, okay, um, good, several, a couple of months, maybe. Yeah, because if you're working on a big book deadline, that's right. got to be hard. Well, when I was working on, um, uh, I was the last one when I was working on up in Lake County at a, on a ranch up there. Um, I was working on a guidebook then, and and uh, so in between helping them survive, I would run around and take pictures and come back and see if they were still alive or not. <laughs> All right, so where can our audience find you? Do you have a website? RogerLHammer.com. Roger L. L. Hammer. Roger L. Hammer. And it's just like a regular old hammer. Right. Dot yeah, com. Right. And um, that, my website has um, my email address if anybody needs to contact me that way, or, um, you know, and all my books are on there, you know. And, and, and all my books and even the car, those identification cards are all on Amazon or. Uh, whatever bookstores are left anymore, um, 
that's yeah. they're, they're out there. One thing you can do on Amazon is follow the author too, which I like. Right, right. So if you put anything new out, people will find it right away. They'll get right. it. So that's kind of cool. Yeah, if they were to go to Amazon and just type in my name, the whole shebang would come up. But if they go to RogerLHammer.com, they can just click on the link there, and it'll take them somewhere to buy it. Well, no, um, it'll. No, you, at least you'll, if you see what book you want, then just go type the title into Amazon. And okay. It'll go from there. All right. Well, thank you for being on the show oh, again. My pleasure. <laughs> You've got so much information in that brain of yours. <laughs> yeah. Let me know if you want to be on Naked and Afraid. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> I'm, I'm not. In fact, if you would have told me like 10 years ago that I would be hiking in the swamp up to my waist and with alligators. I would have never believed you. If you would have told me one year ago that I'd be a morning person, I wouldn't believe you. So people can change. Can. <laughs> All right. Um, to the audience, if you would do us a big favor again, and please leave us a review on iTunes. It's so helpful to us. If you have any suggestions for topics or guests, just email me at info at understandphotography.com. I'm Peggy Farron. Thank you so much for watching the Understand Photography Show. We'll see you next Friday.